everybody. Three Righteous Mamas is a podcast that is on a mission to transform our country. We tell the stories that matter, celebrate the power and hope of pissed off mamas who are building a better future for all of our children. Hi, I'm Martha Pinkoff. And I'm Christina Sansun Ramirez. And I'm Muna Husseini. Also, please subscribe. Let us know what you think about Three Righteous Mamas by giving us a review and tell your friends. That's how we spread the word about that. We want to hear from you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, now that that business is handled, I am excited to introduce you to our guest today. She's somebody that you likely already know, um, Maria Hinojosa, who you likely know from Latino USA. She is an icon in journalism, and we're so excited to, to share her book, Once I Was You, and, um, and our conversation with her. Um, but first, we're going to talk to each other about some mom bod realness because we're like 10 months into the pandemic and I think it's time to talk about body positivity. Yeah, for all those um, extra 10 pounds we've all gained. <laughs> right. Right. Um, how are y'all doing? Well, um, I guess I will start and uh, I have gained the requisite 10 pounds <laughs> and lost it and gained it and lost it. So I'm doing the whole yo-yo thing, but hopefully I'm like, this time I only gained five pounds. So uh, let's, let's stick with being uh, on the up and up there. Uh, so interesting conversation I had with my daughter around body positivity. So I have a 12 year old and we were talking the other day and, and she happened to tell me like, mommy, I think it's really pretty when women have um, lips. And, and if you can see my lip, like I have a little bow right there at the top of my lips. And she goes, I like it when women have one that, that's not there and that their, their, their upper lip is, is very poofed out, I guess. And, um, you know, I sat there and I thought about it and I said, you know, I know some people naturally have lips like that. But most people I know that have lips like that have it because of surgery. And uh, it made me think twice, like, wow, like, what is she seeing on social media? And is this a realistic aspiration for her to look a certain way when she's been born a certain way? And I thought, you know, like, I'm not going to poo-poo other people's decisions. Like, they make the decisions that are right for them. But then we had a conversation about what's real. <laughs> and... Um, you know, we happen to watch like Kirsten Cavallari getting, getting red carpet ready. And she literally, I think we counted, she had like 32 people helping her get ready, which is by the way, crazy. <laughs> I mean, okay. Maybe it wasn't 32. I think it might've been like 27, but you get the point. Like she had a different person doing her earrings, a different person, like parting her hair, a different person combing it. And I just thought, okay, so what you see is not real. And don't aspire to that. And like, you know, we have a conversation about what it means to, to be happy with what you have. Um, but it, it worries me a lot, like the impact that social media has on us and like what, what we can be happy with, right, with our bodies. So it's like an ongoing conversation, whether it's us or our kids. Yeah, it's, I, I feel like that too, especially, I mean, Santi's smaller. So the, the way little kids that don't have those messages live freely in their bodies, right. And just like are happy and in the moment and just free to be themselves. Like, that's what I actually want my son to keep and like all of our kids to keep. Um, but it is hard, right? Like uh, thinking about also my own self, not just my kids, but like how my body changed after I gave birth and I listened to, and sometimes like, you know, it's things other people notice or just you yourself notice when you're by yourself. Right. And you're like, Oh, this has moved. This feels different. Um, mm -hmm. and I listened to this great, uh, recording of, um, a mom and about body positivity after you give birth is like, look at all those stretch marks look at the way your body will never be the same and look at the gift that your body carried another human being for months 
in your body and gave birth to another life? Like, did you think that that wasn't going to change your body? Of course it did. (laughs) Um, and that like every stretch mark or scar, that's a reminder of your power. And I thought that was like a really beautiful way to think about it. Um, and I've only had one child, but like, I definitely felt the difference after, um, giving birth and yeah, it's never going to be the same. And sometimes I will admit it's like frustrating to me because I want to be my old self, but I have to ask like where that comes from. And, um, never for a second, do I ever regret it looking at my little guy, like things change, but I want to aspire to be like how he is free in his body and just comfortable no matter whether he's got a pot belly sticking out or anything like he's just happy being him wherever he is or however he looks. Right. I like how you said that about, about turning how we think about scars or stretch marks on its side. I mean, who said that those things are bad and you know, I love it. Our body tells our story and our stories Mm -hmm are beautiful because they're ours intrinsically good because they're our story, you know? So I really like, I like that sentiment a lot. Thank you for sharing it, Christina. Yeah, it's- I do. I've had kind of a funny, I've, I've had a fun journey in this body that I inhabit and it has served me. It serves me so well, but like I, when I was little, I was a real tomboy. Like I would wear my denim on dem- denim and my cowboy boots and, I didn't have a care in the world about what anybody thought of me. And then like in the eighth grade, I remember I put on red lipstick for the first time and suddenly everybody was like, whoa, paying attention. And I was like, huh, there is power in this. (laughs) And I lived like super femi um, for a long time. Like it was tall and thin and red lips and big boobs and all the stuff that that society wanted me to have, but I was never happy in, in that form. And so I I came out and then I like threw away my scale and then I have like made it back into my body. And, you know, I swim and I lift weights and I do things like that, that really center me in it. And I have gotten to a place at 43, um, where I've never been happier in my physical form. Mm -hmm. And it's different. Like, I don't even know how it's changed, how it does. And I know that my clothes still fit. So (laughs) that's good. Um, But like, I am, I feel like I have finally arrived in, in my vessel. That's awesome, Martha. How'd you do that? Um, Well, no, I mean, I, I looked, started to, I mean, I always look at the messaging that I'm being fed and who is feeding me the messages and what their motivation is in feeding me these messages. And I feel like so much of our, of the stories we're told about femininity and presentation and body shape and hair color and skin color and all of that um, are unattainable, first of all. Um, but they're tricks to get us to buy shit, you know? And so I think it's a scam. You must have. And little kids know it's a scam, right? Like little kids don't, they are just gorgeous in their little beings. Yeah. You must have been putting down some really deep roots, which took hold that help you stand in yourself over time. And uh, that's really beautiful to hear because we already know, but when do we start listening to ourselves? And it sounds like you've gotten really good at hearing that voice inside your head. Yeah, I definitely have. It's interesting. Like I've heard this, um, this concept that like we curate our spaces, we curate our bookshelves, like, oh, you know, this sofa, this pillow, this outfit, how much do we curate the content inside of our heads and, and manage it so that we let in the messages and we keep the messages we believe in. And then we, you know, we're like, man, I don't really like this one. Like I, I call bullshit. Yeah. And um, how important it is. And so body positivity has always been a really big one for me. And like, I never, 
you know, like I, I've always struggled with like when people are walking around and they tell little girls like, Oh, you're so pretty. You're so cute. And I always struggled with that because yes, it's true. But did that person do something to achieve that? Or was it something they were born with? And so like, I've always been focused on, okay, if I'm going to compliment a kid, it's going to be the effort they put into doing something. And so I never used to talk about my body or make comments. And so if if any of y'all have ever met my daughter, she's skinny. She plays soccer competitively and she has, I don't know, like her thighs are as big as my arm. Like she's skinny, tall. She's a beanpole. And she's always been that way. And when she was, I think, six, six ladies and gentlemen and folks, uh, she went to go play with a little friend. And I think the friend and the mom were trying on clothes and mom said something like, oh, my thighs are so fat in this. And then the little girl turned around and told my daughter like, oh, your thighs are fat too. So I didn't know this, but for six months, my daughter stopped wearing shorts in Texas And I kept saying like, oh, wear your shorts. And she was like, no, I don't want to. And she'd always be wearing pants. And finally I was like, why are you not wearing shorts? And she kind of like got uncomfortable and I noticed something and I had to work on her. And then she told me the story, like da da da. my little friend told me that I have fat thighs and I don't want to wear shorts anymore. And I'm sitting there like my mind exploded because the messaging that my six-year-old received got embedded in her so deep that she was worried about her body. And you know what? She was skinny, but even if she wasn't, I was just furious that someone could make her feel less than at such a young age. And it took me months to get her past that. Like legs are for running, legs are for moving, legs are for being strong. Like they help you do so many things. Like you should be happy with what you have. Right. And um, she finally got over it, but it's just this constant, like, you know, waves coming in and you have to like hold them off. And I know it's not just for, for little girls or little boys, like all of our kids struggle with it in in some way, shape, form or fashion to like manage all that pressure. And so it's the messaging I'm hearing from both of y'all is so beautiful and so positive. And, um, I love it. And I want to cultivate that energy around me. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Well, it's like you say, it's uh, cultivating that energy is bringing in people that will reflect that back to you and knowing the noise to block out, right? And like our kids are so, um, you know, they're, what's so great about them also, like their minds are so malleable, right? They're so um, absorbent and willing to learn, Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they can learn the wrong things, right? Mm -hmm. And I think being able to shape and help give them the tools. And for me growing up, you know, especially girls, like the data is very clear that girls are much more impacted by images of how they should be and like their physicality and like what they're supposed to project um, and how that really also impacts issues like depression Mm -hmm. in young girls, um, self-esteem, confidence. And I know one of the things we'll be talking to Maria about later is confidence, but you know, it's just something that has to be talked a lot more about with all of our kids, but especially our girls. And one of the books that I would recommend to parents and moms when I was 14 or 15 years old, I found the book. It's actually for parents, but I found it and it's called Reviving Ophelia. I don't know if anyone's oh, yeah. read it. And yeah, it was by, I think a psychologist. Um, and it's different stories of girls going through adolescence Um, and discovering who they are and how they have all these forces and messages placed on how they're supposed to be perfect and beautiful. And it's girls of all different races and incomes being told they have to be this very singular way, also like a white standard of beauty. And just reading it and realizing like, oh, I'm feeling this and lots of other people are feeling this. And it's not, I don't have to feel this way. And it just broke it for me. And so like, you can break it like you did, Mm -hmm. Muna, it took work. But Mm -hmm. even if your kids do learn these messages, like you can remind them of their beauty, their ability to be free in their own bodies. And like Martha is learning, is like doing that at 43. um, And I'm doing that in this cool new body that gave birth to the most awesome little human being. And so, hell yeah, you know? Um, love your body. They are remarkable. 
Well, uh, it's awesome to be talking about the truth that we know and standing up for that truth and excited to be talking about Maria, who is not only a trailblazer, but somebody who um, has been speaking truth and standing up for the truth. And so uh, let's go on and and chat with her. What do y'all say? Let's do it. Our next guest has been one of the most important voices in journalism in America. Over the last 30 years, she has been known to tackle and push news institutions to cover the stories that matter from a more diverse and people of color lens. I grew up listening and learning to her from her show, Latino USA. As a young Latina, her show helped me find my own way. Her work has won awards from Emmys and Peabody's, and she has a fan base across the country. We are excited to be joined by Maria Hinojosa and encourage everyone to buy her new book at her favorite bookstore, Pals, or anywhere you can find it. It's entitled Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. You should also follow her. She's incredibly witty and smart on Twitter, if you don't already, at Maria underscore Hinojosa. So we're so excited to talk with you uh, about what it means to be a trailblazer, about how you found the confidence, not just to chart a new course, but overcome fear that it took to do that. And my uh, co-host actually taught me a new acronym when we were coming to talk to you. They got so excited. They said, uh, BFD, that you're a BFD, a big fucking deal. So we're really excited to have you here with us. And we always start by talking to our guests about their moms or a maternal figure that influenced them and made you the person you are today. So tell us about her. I I just love the question because today in particular, um, I was answering that question. So I'm in the midst of writing another book. Um, I can't give you more details because it's not public yet, but let me give you a hint. Um, If you were a young person, you're going to be able to read this book. And it might happen to just be a version of Once I Was You. I'm just saying. So today, my writing assignment, and right now, when I'm writing Um, I'm not in New York right now. I've disconnected from New York because I'm writing. And so I'm in a deep Connecticut uh, woods, actually. And so I really go into like a state of just, you know, I listen to particular like uh, binaural beats that are just like, you know, kind of hypnotic. And I go into this space. And so today was all about connecting to my mother and a decision that she made, which was pivotal in my life and which y'all are going to love. Because it was the moment when my mother wrote a letter to the teachers of all of my my two brothers, my sister, myself, saying that she was taking us, she was taking us out of school to take us to a demonstration on that day. Mm. And that she was in charge of us and she understood that she was taking them out of school, but that this was a decision she was making. And she wanted the school to be aware that they were not, we were not ditching. She was, we were under her her. Uh, responsibility. And this is what we were going to do. And, and then we went to um, what I thought was a massive demonstration. I mean, I was eight years old. Uh, My sister was 15. We were on the phone just talking about that this morning, just now. And we were just like mom's decision to say, no van a la escuela. They're not going to school. They're coming and we're going to. My dad was not, you know, my dad was a nerdy medical doctor dedicated to research. Um, he wasn't like, let's take to the streets. But that that moment actually was what injected my blood system with the notion of democracy. And because we were very aware that it was only my father who could vote. He was the only one who was a citizen. The rest of us were not citizens. But this moment was like, Oh, but you can do these other things beside watch the news. You, you, us can actually be there and your mother is teaching you this lesson. I think that story says everything. 
Yeah. And what's your mom's name? I saw you post pictures of her recently. Yeah, so Berta. Yeah, Berta. Berta Hinojosa. Berta Hinojosa Ojeda. So, you know, speaking about you realize you didn't have to just watch the news, right? But you've been reporting um, for years. And it's, it's like I said, we grew up, all of us listening to you. Um, and you had a huge influence of, over us and taught so many people across this country about numerous issues, but also how to see and understand the world from how Latinos live it in this country. And you wrote this incredible book um, that we mentioned before. It's documenting your trailblazing career. Once I was you, everyone should buy it. And it's super fast paced and fun to read. But I want to know, you know, you're doing all kinds of journalism as is now, but why did you decide to write this book? And like, who was it for? So, um, so, so writing a book is actually really hard. Um, it's not something that as a journalist where you have maybe a daily, weekly, maybe a, you know, a, a month long deadline, but writing a book is an extended deadline. It takes a lot of time and effort. And I didn't really want to do this. Um, my last book, I had written two books, uh, Cruise Gang Members Speak to Maria Hinojosa, which was like a Studs Terkel interview book for young adults. And then I wrote my memoir, Raising Raul, which was a beautiful book, but didn't sell. And I was very stung by that experience. Um, I had a lot, you know, the publishing world is a thing, separate and apart. We can talk about that. But I was like, yeah, no, I don't really want to write this book. But in 2016, I had it. So 2016, pivotal year right? For so many of us. I used to be back then on MSNBC a lot more, which is very interesting to me. I'm like, I was on more four years ago, but I really need to be on more now, but it, so be it. And I had a moment where I corrected a Latino uh, Trump supporter, Steve Cortez, who used the word illegals. And I said, illegal is not a noun. You know, you don't call human beings illegals. That's that I learned that from Elie Wiesel. He was the one who said, the first thing the Nazis did was to declare the Jews to be an illegal people. We don't use that term. That was taken by Fusion that made a little clip of it and it went viral. And like millions of people saw it. And my, I love all these connections because the chair of my board, Deepa Donde, who is based in Austin, Texas, said, and she's my best friend and the chair of my board and Futuro exists in large part because of her vision and brilliance and friendship and commitment. She was the one who said, you got to write a book now. It's got to be illegal is not a noun. And I was like, all right, well, you know what? I'm going to write a little book. I'm going to write a little like that, like little books that you pick up at the airport. Remember back when we were in the airports? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, when? Five years ago? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you'd like pick up your candy bar, you know, whatever thing that you were going to do, but then you'd pick up, you'd want something. So you'd see, um, you know, Chimamanda Adichie's We Are All Feminists, or, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, or in you, these small books. And I was like, I'll, buy, I'll write a small book that you can read in 45 minutes, and it will be why you should never use the term illegal is not a now. By the but way, that, I'm just going to say the 45 minutes, that's you speed reading. The rest of us, it's a little bit longer, but sure, 45 minutes, Maria. <laughs> but, but no, I'm not a speed reader. So what I'm saying is that you basically are writing something that is you know, compressed. I'm not a speed reader. So please, I, and I don't like it when people try to make an impression of that. So no, not at all. I'm a slow reader. Um, fast writer though, it turns out, but slow reader, which is interesting. So who knows once, once the, um, in, once the inspiration comes anyway. So I was like, yeah, no, I'll, I'll write this little book. And then I had to get an agent and then, you know, you have to sell this and then da, 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 da. And they were like, we don't want a small book. We want a big book from you. And that is a fellow Latina, my um, editor at Simon and Schuster, Michelle Herrera Mulligan, who said, we want a big book from you. And that's when I was like, Oh no, but by then it was too late. I already had a contract, <laughs> you know, and I was like, yeah. And that was the idea behind Once I Was You, not to be a small book, but to have a book that was going to be much larger than what I lived through, which was pretty interesting, okay, an interesting period of time, which is including this moment, but actually much bigger so that everybody can understand, well, there, there's a lot of history here that I need to read. And that's how Once I Was You was born. I love that. And, and Illegal is Not a Noun is one of the chapters in the book, so... You, everybody needs to, again, go get that book. Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in, in the 
in the path that you've taken, in, especially in journalism. And having founded an institution in Latino USA is, you know, in the book you talk about falling in love with the news, it's in 60 minutes, um, with 60 minutes. And then the moment that you find WBEZ Chicago and all of that, um, I really resonate because that like it, when you find your thing, it just lights everything up. And so I could really feel that um, in your description of those moments. And I feel like journalism has, um, has changed so much since 1992 and the founding of Latino USA, but you have held true and you've held the center. And, and I was just struck by, in reading the book, thinking about, we used to have one source of information and, and now we don't, we, we very much live in different realities. Um, so what is that like as, as a journalist and, and, and the role that Latino USA has played in that. So I want to give credit to the founders of Latino USA. Um, okay. Maria Miriam Martin. Um, and uh, se me olvidó su nombre ahorita, but it will come to, and Gilberto Cárdenas um, from University of Texas okay. at Austin and the okay. Center for Mexican American Studies. And they asked me to be the founding anchor. And then 10 years ago, um, I did take over Latino USA. We moved it from KUT in Austin to New York and Futuro. Mm -hmm. And that's when we, you know, finally won a Peabody. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, it's a very interesting question because, and it's also a very hard one for me to answer, yeah. which is how is it that I was able to navigate this? Right. You know, how, and I think that's what I'm trying to say in the book. There is a certain level of, uh, I, I think of, um, is it Kierkegaard or who says you jump over the cliff or is it Nietzsche? But, you know, there's a lot of the jumping over the cliff in moments when I didn't even know that that was about to happen. And that that, that, that decision, which I think in many ways it propelled is propelled because I'm an immigrant myself, um, because I never felt like I had a safety net. I mean, you know, I could always go back and live con mi mamá y mi papá, absolutely, and not pay rent ever. And I could stay there forever. But, you know, um, they there was not a safety net. There was not any anything like that and in my whole life. And so I think that that allowed me to take that leap to just be like, well, what the hell, you know? And that allowed me to create Futuro Media. It allowed me to... A, you know, in those moments, like when I talk about answering back uh, when I was writing for Walter Cronkite, like that moment, what the hell happened? You know, like that I just responded back to him and I was like, no, I'm, no, we're going to go down and we're going to talk. You know, I feel like in those moments, to be honest with you, it's like I'm my ancestors are coming through to me and they're just like wow. and, and somehow I'm able to be like, OK as opposed to what many of us do, which I also do, which is to shut it off and just be like, no, 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 you can't. So they like, cause I don't really Maria, understand. Yes. For the sake of our audience, can you tell a little bit about that story? That story? Okay. So um, I, I love this story. Uh, actually, I was, I'm in the middle of watching a documentary about um, uh, old news footage and Walter Cronkite came up and I was like, dude, there he is. And you know, back then we didn't have phones in our camera, cameras in our phones. So I didn't, I don't have any pictures of me with Walter Cronkite, but I did produce for him. And the story goes that I produced his end of the year special in 1987. And I had to write, I had to write his end of the year commentary. Um, I was a budding journalist and I had never had, I had never been asked to do anything like that before. I was young. Um, I had written uh, scripts for Scott Simon, but they were, drafts of scripts that then he would take and and really make his own this was like no you're writing for him and I was like damn and so I went into a state of panic and you know didn't feel like I was good enough and spent a lot of time there but you know I had to write this that's another one of these moments where I'm just like you got to jump off the cliff right yeah. you just you just jump off that's it and so I yeah. prepared and then I got into that zone and I wrote this thing and I actually had you know my some of my um journalistic mentors look at it. I rewrote, I, you know, I, I softened because I didn't want to be the angry Latina, even though I was, but then I was like, it's, you're an angry 
you're an angry person from the United States. I still wasn't a citizen because Oliver North was friggin' selling crack in, in our neighborhoods, right? Um, okay, whatever. So I, I write this thing and my boss is like, yeah, no, Walter Cronkite will never read this. You, this he, it looks like you wrote this. And that's when I was like, well, we're going to go down to the editor of the evening news and you're not going to tell him who wrote it and you're going to read it to him and see what he thinks. I felt like, where did I get the ovaries to do that? I don't know. I guess because, you know, I really had prepared. And I just want to say that, that sometimes you're like when my mom had to, you know, it's kind of fight or flight and you have to take a moment. I actually encourage women, moms, which we have to listen to that voice as opposed to quiet it. Um, it's a very powerful part of, of who we are. So that's, that's that story. <laughs> that's a great story. And I think that we're conditioned to silence that voice and not listen to it because there's a, there's a big threat in us listening to that voice and moving into and, and accepting that power. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think actually what we're living through right now, yeah, actually your podcast, um, everything about the last four or five years has been about that, right. Has been another moment of like living through the late 1960s and early seventies where it was all about protest, where it was all about um, accountability, where it was all about, I mean, you know, in terms of the women's movement per se, cause I'm thinking about it a lot too. It was very influential in my life. Um, but very quickly it went from, you know, this great radical feminism um, to, we want to wear suits and be like men and be CEOs. And I was like, you know, Oh, oh you know, it was just, a, it became, you know, just too capitalist for me too quickly. Um, Maria, that's something awesome. that's really interesting for me as I, I hear you talking is this thread around being able to hear your inner voice, being able to, I think you said earlier, my ancestors were coming through and this just authenticity and honesty about what you actually feel. And even if you didn't have the confidence saying, but I prepared for this, this is what I mean. This is what's important. Um, you know, in, in one of your first books, right? Raising Raul was about balancing motherhood and this fast paced career you had. And, and so many women were struggling with finding that balance of like, this is what I need to do. And then still dealing with guilt, right? And you talk about that guilt. Um, and looking back now, what is your advice to moms in like listening to that voice inside of their head and balancing guilt and balancing kind of like what you know is right? So, so here's the thing about your kids. They grow up and they become adults. And then all of a sudden there's a pandemic and you're living with them 24-7, 365. And there is a reckoning. Right. So um, parenthood is like life. There is there will be multiple reckonings that happen, but it isn't like at one point you get to nirvana and it's just like, oh, cool. I figured it all out. And so for me, it can, remains. Uh, my son just turned 25. He works with me, which means he works a lot. Um, he's an incredible human being with an extraordinary heart. And the message to mothers is a capacity to communicate. So we want to encourage the constant possibility of dialogue. I mean, my kids were doing therapy pretty early on. I'd take them to see my therapist when I would see her every now and then, who became a friend of the families. But I would just be like, yeah, you can do a little session. So encouraging them to learn how to speak about their emotions. Um, but also being prepared to be... so. We as women, we need to have that passion. I, I applaud so many women who have extraordinary patience with children like my husband. I don't. It's not my strength. Honestly. Like, like finding joy in cooking. Not my strength. I'm cooking tonight. Um, I hope I have time. Today's a kind of busy day, but I am making enchiladas suizas. I decided I made my own green salsa. Like I'm, a, I'm on a thing, but it doesn't happen that often. And it's not my like, oh my God, I love this. So I'm not that kind of a mom. And I have to recognize that. And so thankfully I had a partner who was like, cool, I got this, right? That's the bomb. 
But the guilt thing, I think we have to realize that we have got to serve our passions and that, yes, ultimately our children will see that. And we have to have that open dialogue constantly. There's got to be that open dialogue because they will resent. You know, they will resent if you're not there. Um, And so, for example, Raul, who just turned 25, he was like, so he didn't have to say it, but I knew that what I should not do was to go on social media and post about his birthday because he was like, I don't want that Maria Hinojosa today, Mm -hmm. the one who's on social media. I want my mother. Mm. And so I guess what I'm saying is that always be prepared to be having that constant dialogue with your, I've been in therapy with both of my kids this whole year with their therapists, with my therapist, we're having, we're figuring it out. We're literally figuring it out because this is what it looks like. It's not Nirvana. It is about the dialogue and like we're in it. We're going to talk about, it. we're going to figure, and by the way, not a perfect family. I mean, we have our, like, you know, like stuff is happening, but we're in it. And that's what I, that's what I tell them. I'm like, y'all see, we're having a great dinner tonight. Everybody's happy. Everybody's cool. And, and when we're doing the hard work, that's what family, that is the definition of family, that hard work. Yeah. And I guess as I'm listening to you, We have to have that integrity in our micro interactions in order to take that and model it out in the world and be able to have that integrity, I guess, in journalistic integrity even, right? So if you're not doing it and practicing it on a day-to-day basis, then how do you go outside and do it? And they will call you on it, you know? So I have to answer when my kids say, well, you know, it's interesting that when you're interviewing people, you have a better capacity to listen than when you're talking to us. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> or they're like, or, or they're, or they're like, uh, so it's really nice that you'll drop everything to take a phone call from Estrella, who's in prison, trans, undocumented. I mean, they know her. So they love her. They've, they've never met her, but, but they're like, but you know, what about us? You know, And so I have to answer to that and respond to the demand of, I am a mother. But then I also tell them like, (laughs) this is the, I'm just like, okay, see now the reason why dad and I have been able to be married for 30 years is because he doesn't control me. Never. So I need to find a place where I can, because I don't like to be controlled. And I also have to find, as my therapist says, you know, and I talk about a lot, right? The humility. We got to be in touch with that. And our our, our kids do keep us humble. And parenting never ends. Never ends. And like like therapy, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can thread the needle between therapy and immigration, but the things that we don't address, the truths that we don't honestly address and, um, and look at and and deal with the pain of are the ones that keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. This is true in our personal life and it's certainly true in the history of this country. And one of the things that we talked about before we were on the call with you is how much we admire your um, commitment to speaking truth around immigration, not only to Republican administrations, but to Democrat administrations and really, having so much integrity about that conversation and who we have always been in that conversation. And I have just would love for you to address where we are now as, as we move into a new administration. Is there, what can the Biden administration do to end the cycle of violence um, in our immigration system? I mean, that's that's like the extraordinary thing that's happening is that we are witness to that history as it is happening. And you all know this. What we do in each of our particular roles in this moment is going to be determinant. So I'm continuing to push to try to get an interview with Kamala or with Joe Biden. They have not agreed to that yet. And I've been asking for almost a year, a year and a half now. Which I think is, is is unjust. I just don't mm-hmm. think it's right. Not that I'm the big deal, but because of what of what Latino USA represents. Yes. Um see, I I just think <clears throat> that when that politically 
okay, I'm going to be a Dolores Huerta here. And, and even AOC, which is you have a crisis and you have an opportunity. You have a human rights crisis, an international human rights crisis in the United States of America that is being perpetrated by the American government mm -hmm. on people whose only crime is that we were not born in this country. Right. Therefore, because of that, you have women's uteruses being taken and children in cages. And people, women, men, children, toddlers, babies, I'm sorry, being raped consistently. Okay. We know this. We don't know about the babies and the toddlers because they can't talk. Mm -hmm. But if they're raping women but and men, know. if they're raping women and men who can speak. Okay. Um, so I think you have, he has the perfect opportunity. Oops. Are you guys there? Oh, God, something really weird happened. We're here. Okay, okay good. Um, <clears throat> has the perfect opportunity to, um, to basically, a, uh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Weird stuff is happening on this computer. Okay, but okay. Um, Joe Biden has the perfect opportunity to say it stops now entirely entirely i don't and i'm struggling with this because i am a journalist right and so i'm usually not one to be making demands you know pull kind of like out and out but you know the truth is i'm getting older okay and so i i don't the the, the patience thing is actually a very interesting one um and so i as a journalist who has been covering this for 30 years and who has been throughout all of this being told, well, you need to calm down. You need to wait. You need to right. just, you know, you need to just pull back, just wait, just come on, give them a little space. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. And actually in my responsibility as an American journalist, a descendant of Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. then actually it is my responsibility to say asking for patience now is inhumane. So that's kind of where I'm at. As you can see, I'm trying to keep calm <laughs> because it you know, really, I, I just don't see how, how we can continue here. I just don't see how we can ask in the same way as people are saying, but George Floyd was murdered in front of our eyes. How much more? Right. Breonna Taylor was asleep. How much more? Right. And there's something to be said for the passion and, and the emotion that's coming through because these are such important things. And, you know, when we think about how the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas were impacted after the, the mass shooting at their school and their, their drive to have change and not be patient anymore, I think it says something about our appetite for not being okay with the status quo anymore. And um, I love your drive and I love your fire and I don't want to let this continue anymore. And, you know, one of the reasons we do this podcast is because we don't want to be, I, I don't want to be helpless or weak. And, you know, it's super important to be highlighting that there are people out there building the world for our kids right now that we want to live in. And so as I think about our audience and I think about your sort of legacy of like being a witness, telling the truth, standing up for what's right, those are all things that we want to see embodied out in the world. And um, what advice do you have for our listeners that we can be doing and thinking about right now, right? It's not like, you know, as I was, one of the things we were chatting about earlier off the call was, when you read stuff in the news, it feels far away, right? That, that folks are doing things and it's far away, but I believe there's things that we could all be doing just like right now to be building that world. So what advice do you have considering this is what you do for your career and on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, you know, and by the way, um, you know, I feel very alienated a lot of the time too, which is why I go out to nature and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> you know, sleep with my dog and because he allows me to hug him. I sleep with my husband, but he's not a hugger. So the dog, you know, um, I, 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 
do feel desperate. And I, you know, and people are looking at me like, but, but you're leading the way. I'm like, oh my God. So I liked, I've been thinking a lot today about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Um, because of what I was writing about in my memories. I mean, I saw him alive and, and, you know, he did not have a playbook. Uh, he, he did not have a five-year strategic plan. <laughs> he had a dream. And so um, that's kind of where I'm just like, uh, what do we do? We each have to kind of find that, what are we doing? Now, you know, because I'm a journalist, it's actually what I can do is this, like I can't be an activist. I can't contribute to political campaigns. I don't make political donations. I can't um, be out on the street going to protests unless I'm covering them. I can't be kind of, um, you know, I, ha I, I have these ethics. At the same time, my journalistic ethics, which I'm 100% solid on, and hence all of the awards in, in the name of white men, by the way, the Cronkite, the Kennedy, the Turkle, the, et cetera, um, that, that does that is not impacting the fact that as a journalist, again, I feel an extraordinary responsibility to, to do what I can, which is call out the truth. I find it very interesting that people say, what can you do? Because I'm like, no, actually, you know what to do. Actually, what I would say is get quiet and listen to your own. Go take that walk in nature. What is it that you can do? You know, one thing that I can do is that I, I can talk to anyone. I'm just like, you don't see anyone except for the people at the grocery store. <laughs> you know, I had my first manicure pedicure yesterday, um, an Ecuadorian immigrant here in Connecticut. So, okay, I'll be seeing her once a month, you know, masked and safe, but um, I'm not really seeing anybody. But when I do go to the grocery store, I'll talk to, you know, if I can. So are you going to vote? What are you thinking about? Because I want to try to encourage people to feel like they have a voice. But if I was living in this community where I am right now in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut, you know, I'd be like, I don't know, I'd be, if I'm in church, I'd be organizing, you know, conversations about this. Like, what? Am, so what can I do that's more, I'm going to hold a book event in my town here. There's a lot of Trump support in this little town. It It's kind of new. That's what I'm going to do that I can do. Um, how did I come to that? I was just thinking. So I'm putting it back on you to say, to encourage your listeners and viewers to just be like, well, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like there are a lot of organizations that exist. So what can you do? Um, you know, I, there, there's a lot that can be done, but here's the thing. If you're not doing anything, that's a problem because you will feel weakened by that. And even if it's sending, you know, a monthly donation, you know, to multiple places that maybe is only $5 a, a month, even that is doing something that is helping. Um, and so we need people to be engaged at every level. So Maria, I want to just call out, you know, as an organizer, you just said, you know, you use your voice, right? Like with what I do is I use my voice. And as an organizer, I spent a long time, obviously, at organizing undocumented workers. And I remember some people used to say, well, you're speaking for people that don't have a voice. And what I learned is, no, I'm not speaking for people that don't have a voice. Everyone has a voice. Sometimes we're not listening. And instead, we're lifting up their voices to be heard. And I see so much of what you've done in your career as that. And also the fact that you've been this incredible trailblazer for so many people. I include myself in that, um, feeling like there's a path and there's a vision and there's a way. And also recognizing that you didn't have a playbook to do that, but you've done it with a lot of grace and a lot of power and learning from mistakes. And so I just want to thank you for, as a young Latina that grew up mostly in Ohio and only knew my Mexican mother and my family in Mexico, like you helped me find my place, my way by the path that you created for our community. So thank you. Thank you. And for... I, and for so many women. So thank you for spending the time with us and for writing this tremendous book and being here with us. Thank you. I love what you did. You're all about what I see as our future. So I'm just loving the fact that the three of you came to, together to do this. Um, and I loved having a conversation with you. So 
happy to join you again because it's kind of easy <laughs> when I'm in my bedroom with my slippers on as opposed to having to take a plane to Austin, which was always a thing because it was like, is there a direct flight? <laughs> not, there's like, really not anymore. And really not. So I miss, I miss Austin. I miss Texas. And I will just say in terms of Texas, um, I'm fascinated by what's happening and by the potential and the fact that I was in a tiny way trying to document, you know, what you all know, which was, it's not that Texas is red or blue. It's that we're a non-voting state and and witnessing this whole thing of like, no, actually we are going to vote um, has just been really wonderful. So I thank all of you for your different work and for this particular podcast. It's a badass move. Thank you. And everyone go buy her amazing book again. Once I was with you. And if you buy it, if you buy it, just find me on social media. No, excuse me. We're going to say when you buy it, go on. Okay. Right. <laughs> when you buy it, just find me on social media. I'm pretty easy to track down. And I have stickers that I ha I'm, I've signed and then we will send one to you. Lily, um, who's working with me on the book, we have a bunch and we'll send one to you and then you can just put that in your book and you have a signed book. So Great. let us know. We're happy to do that for you. Okay, awesome. We will do that. And we send you a, I send you a huge hug. We all send you a huge hug as, yeah. big, as big as Texas. So thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. Besitos. Thank you Bye. so much. So I took a lot of notes, of course, we always do. Um, but there were a couple of things actually as from her vantage point as a parent right now to a 27 year old child um, that I was, that I really am taken by and inspired by. Um, but she said that to encourage the constant possibility of dialogue and my wife, Joe is, is so intentional about that with our kids right now. And I, and I know that she does that because she is laying the groundwork for us to have these harder conversations later. And it was just such a, such a good reminder to me that the parenting never ends. Um, and affirmation, she also said that we have to serve our passions. Um, and so I felt affirmed by that because sometimes um, my passions in particular take me out of parenting all of the time. And, and I think that my kids ultimately will be proud of the decisions that I've made and they make me a better parent um, when I am in the room with them, which is a lot. Um, but I still, I, I just, I felt a lot of comfort in that. Like, that's that's a conversation that I can have. That's a that's a conversation that I will feel good about. Um, and I just love her energy of like she's not anywhere close to done. None of us are anywhere close to done. We've all got work to do, so let's get to it. Love it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know stereotypically I'm supposed to be I don't know like pregnant and barefoot in the kitchen and like. I don't know whatever the stereotypers say about Muslim women, but like my husband is in my opinion, the much better parent. And I, I really resonated with what she said and, and what you're talking about too, where when I do the things that fulfill me, whether it's through my career or volunteering or community work that I can definitely come home and be a better parent. And it's been great to involve my kids in that. And, um, help them grow and see that there's more opportunity, um, out there. And, um, you know, I echo all the points you said, but then maybe a couple that are different, you know, she kept talking about not knowing what was coming and taking the leap. And, and it just made me think about how much we talk about imposter syndrome and struggling with like, Oh, should I really be here? Should I really be doing this? Is this really going to work? And, maybe for her and, and actually many people, like you don't have a safety net, you don't have anywhere else to go and you don't have any choice. And so then in moving forward, the best thing you can do is to prepare and build your confidence because then even if you're taking a leap, you know, you've left it all out in the field. And so like trying and doing your best because you want to go forward and, and taking risks and hopefully calculated risks when it's possible. Um, 
And then, um, you know, Maria was talking about, uh, I guess, when she's used her voice and, you know, she said something about how maybe she's alone, right? She talked about her dog and going out into nature and like that really, I had to take a breath when she said that. And it, it made me realize, like, I guess when you speak up and you use your voice and you're strong, it can be hard and perhaps it's lonely and maybe there's a price there, but you know what? I think there's something to be said for being able to look in, look in the mirror and feel good about who you see. And, um, you know, we all have to make our choices, right? We all have to make our choices. And um, I, I just really had to appreciate her for that because when you're a, a voice that is standing up, I can imagine that it gets lonely and it can be a thankless job. Like not mm -hmm. everyone appreciates you because in a sense, like you're taken for granted, you're public property. Well, mm -hmm. right, right. The idea of a trailblazer, right? We, we uphold someone that's blazed a trail, but inherently when you're blazing a trail, it means you're doing it alone, right? It's a very lonely journey and that most people um, that are blazing trails for others. There are people that blaze trails for themselves, right? But people mm -hmm. like Maria that blaze trails also for others oftentimes don't even realize that they're doing it while they're, while they're in the mm -hmm. process of it. And that also really stuck with me because Maria, if you read her book and you talk to her, you realize her humility, her courage, but also her self-doubt and just like really humanizes her. And for me as uh, someone in 1992, when she started Latino USA, I was 10 years old. Um, <laughs> and I remember just how much it meant to me to find it like on the radio once a week, you know? And um, to get to speak to her now, um, years, later and say, thank you. Right. Um, so many of us are doing work that's lonely, but I think we have to remind ourselves that there are people out there that are grateful for our work, even when it's lonely and hard. And that's the lesson that I walk away with from our conversation with her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm glad we expressed gratitude to her and it, it's a really great reminder that we should continue to be kind to ourselves, but also be expressing gratitude to the folks doing the work because it can be a tiring, hard, uh, unending slog. And even the small things make such a big difference because we're, we're in this for the long haul, right? Like the world for our kids and every bit makes a difference. And, and we're, you know, we're here because we stand on the shoulders of giants. And let's be honest, she's, she's one of them, right? Being a trailblazer and telling the truth and, and her journalism work. And I'm, I'm so excited for my daughter to hear this podcast and, and for others to, to continue to build on what she started. Because as she said, we can't be patient with the things that we want to change. Right. Like, and, and I, I welcome that impatience for, for everyone. So I was really excited to talk to her.